This is Princeton, Indiana, a community of less than 10,000 people, a pleasant community where my husband and I and our four children made our home. The streets are quiet now and bear no evidence of the tragedy that was played out here but a few months ago. A tragedy that reached into the homes of Princeton's people, bringing hate, despair, and fear. This is the church where, for my husband and me, the dreadful story began. My husband, the Reverend Ed Greenfield, had just concluded the Sunday morning service. We were standing at the door of the church, shaking hands with the congregation. You're new, aren't you? I'm Ed Greenfield, and this is my wife, Winnie. Larry Cartwright, my wife, Betty. Hi. Welcome to Princeton. Hope you've been having good luck in finding a place to stay. Well, we have. It's nice, but it's awfully small. We're living in a trailer for the time being. I think we'll be looking for a bigger place soon. Well, let us know if you need any help, won't you? We will. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Hi, right, Winnie. Hi. Good sermon, Ed. Thank you, Clark. It sure was. Thank you, John. And speaking of help thy neighbor, how about giving me a hand with my screens this afternoon? Well, I'd like to, but I have to go down to Union Hall this afternoon. On Sunday? Well, something's up, I guess. Sorry, neighbor. Yeah, I'll bet. It was a typical Sunday in our lives in Princeton. No one could have foreseen that day that our town was on the brink of tragedy. But that afternoon, the stage for the drama that was to follow had already been set. Hey, need some help with those screens? You darn tootin' I do, but you just go along to your union meeting. I'll get along all right. Uh, this is the last one I got, thanks anyhow. Okay, take it easy. I'll all see right. you tomorrow. Yeah. John Stanley went back to his work around the house. And Clark Jones went to this special union meeting. The nature of the struggle was now to appear. Clark was a little late, but it probably wouldn't make any difference. Just some sort of a committee meeting was all it was supposed to be. Today it's me, tomorrow it's you, and the next day it'll be the next guy. Who knows when he's going to be next? There's only one answer to this as far as I'm concerned, and that's strike. Strike and show them who keeps that plant running out there. They've been asking for a strike, and it looks like now's the time they're going to get it. What do they take us for anyway? I ask you, what do they take us for? Fifteen years I have slaved in that place. Five years I have been president of this local. Now some bigwig gets a bug in his pants pocket and they want to tie the can to me. What's going on here? What happened? Company fired Halley. Fired Halley? Yeah, he took too much time off and wouldn't sign the leave of absence slips. The company claims he broke the contract. Well, he did, didn't he? They've been trying to get me for years. And it's not just me either. They want to break the union. They want me out of the way. But what about this contract breaking business, Hallie? Don't mean a thing. Just a technicality. Yes, but... I tell you, it don't mean a thing. And I'm going to tell you once more. We're never going to get our grievances settled against this two-bit outfit unless we show them where we stand. I'm telling you, the only thing those guys in that front office understand for sure is a strike. Now, are you with me in this thing? Do we settle it once and for all? All in favor of strikes, say aye. Aye. Then strike it is. Bert, get the signs issued and tell the boys. Right, Hallie. That plant don't open tomorrow. Good. 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 Boy, Hallie, this is the best thing. It's I'm with you all the way. I'm with you, Hallie. This is right. This will show them up there. Yeah, this is going to open some eyes in that front office. I'll get some stuff straight. You've taken that trash yeah, off these people. Put up with take, the the yeah, this is ridiculous. take something like this to make them sit up and take notice. Yeah, I know, but there's a no-strike clause in our contract with the company. And you know darn well we can't go on strike without an okay from International. I just don't see well, how Clark, they... Well, Clark, Hal is running the show, and Hal must know what he's doing. 
Uh, yeah, I know. And don't forget I... one other thing. We've got other cases, too. Clark Jones had helped set the trap that was soon to amaze most of the people of Princeton. The next morning, when the men and women arrived at the plant where many of the people in our town are employed, the place was picketed. And no one wanted to cross the picket lines to get to his job. It was a complete surprise to everyone, except the handful who had been invited to the special union meeting. Look, I can't go on strike. We're gonna have a baby. I don't know what this is all about. Clark, hey Clark. What the Sam Hill's going on around here? What are all these pickets for? Nobody said anything about a strike vote meeting. Well, I didn't know it was gonna be that either. When I got there, Hallie and his bunch were screaming strike. Hallie, huh? Now look, we're not going out on the limb for him. He knew the rules and he broke them. And president of the local or not, he can lump it as far as I'm concerned. Now wait a minute, that's not all of it. He said we had some grievances. Sure we do, his. He got on his high horse and ramrodded a wildcat because he knew he didn't have a leg to stand on legally, didn't he? Well, who's on his high horse now? Well, don't you think I've got a right to be? Well, don't jump all over me about it. You don't know, maybe we do have grievances. Oh, now, wait a minute, Clark. Clark! Hey, buddy, I wouldn't gripe if I were you. There's such a thing as union loyalty, you know. So that's how it started. With friend angry at friend because of the irresponsible action of a few union leaders in calling a wildcat strike. Larry Cartwright went home to the trailer to tell Betty that he wouldn't be allowed to work. And probably the only thing that frightened her then was what they would do for money, with the baby coming so soon. On the streets, people talked a lot about the strike, but mostly everyone thought it would soon blow over. A few days, maybe, a week at the most. But at our house, there was concern. Oh, girls, it's time for you to go to school. Bye, hon. Bye, Bye, girls. Mm-hmm. Come right home after school now and watch the corner. Bye. You're worried about this strike, aren't you? Who wouldn't be? Nearly a thousand job holders out of work in a town of less than 10,000. It's bound to be a jolt to the community. Well, I'm not quite clear on all of this, but it's just a temporary flare-up, isn't it? Well, it looked like it at first, but some of the men came to see me yesterday, and they don't think so. What did they come to see you about? Well, they didn't want to be a party to something that was ethically wrong. And there's a basis for questioning the ethics of the union leaders here. The men came to me for guidance. Well, if the union's corrupt or something, why don't they just get out? Well, they don't want out. They just want the union run fairly. Well, I'm sure you'll help them. Well, I hardly knew what to tell them. I did say I'd meet with them in any group at any time as a minister, if it had helped them. In a union meeting? Oh, the whole thing may blow over before any meeting's ever held. It seems such a little part of Ed's work to give Christian counsel to those who sought it. But the newspapers picked it up, calling the men who had come to Ed a splinter group of the union. And those who believed that the union was above criticism didn't consider it a little thing at all. A strike can split a small community like a civil war, dividing families, destroying friendships. A strike can precipitate feelings and acts that grow and fester and rise in ugliness and unbelievable vindictiveness. I talked to this Hallie Thompson, and it sounded good. And then I saw the telegram from your international and said the strike was not happening. Hey, what business do you think this is of yours? Friends, friends, I'm trying to help you all. I'm working with union members. If you throw in with them, you're as bad as they are. Yeah, Gab. Hypocrite. Judas. What? What's going on here? What do you think you're doing? Mobbing a minister. Come on, get these people out of here. The 
the cup of hate was running over in Princeton, spilling its poison, contaminating everything it touched. I never thought I'd see mob violence like that in Princeton. I'm sorry I got you into this, Ed. We should have tried to work it out for ourselves. No, John. You were right. I'll admit I wondered at first whether a minister ought to take part in something like this. But now I know I have to. I just wish I were half as sure what the answer is. I think I know. It's the right to join a union or stay out. I don't quite see how that applies here. That won't prevent strikes. No, but it would pave the way for responsible leadership. And if we had that, we never would have had this. How's that? Well, in the first place, if we'd had a chance to decide whether this union out at the plant is worth joining or not, I'll bet a year's dues that the leaders would have seen to it that it was. And in the second place, a bunch like Halley's would have been afraid to pull any shenanigans like this because we could have quit the union without losing our jobs. As it is, they've got us over a barrel. And scared. You know, the reason those people out there were so upset is that they were afraid. Afraid that I was trying to help you tear down something important. What we've got to get across is that we know unions are important. It's only the Halley Thompsons we're fighting. Ed had dedicated himself to the splinter cause. He supported them all the way in the meeting in which, on legal advice, they decided to return to work. But they were met at the gates by strong-armed toughs, many of whom had never been seen in Princeton before. And the first attempt to get through the gates ended in failure. Rowdyism ruled the streets in the night, and splinter windshields were smashed in broad daylight. We mothers of Princeton dreaded to let our children walk the few short blocks to school. And at dusk, my post was the front window, watching, praying Ed would come home safely from his lonely calls to visit the sick and needy. And then one day, Ed called to tell me that the Splinter's second attempt to get through the gates was successful. Yes, they made it. Now, if we can just get that permanent injunction on Friday, maybe this whole thing will work out. That was the last time I answered a telephone without dread. We began to get insulting calls day and night. Over and over until we were tied in knots. Psychological warfare in Midwestern America. In the middle of the turmoil, the splinters met to consider attending the union meeting, where members were to vote for or against settlement of the strike. They'll just rub our noses in the dirt. Even though we still pay our dues, they'll call us scabs and they'll treat us like scabs. They'll make splinter the dirtiest sounding word you ever heard. And you're going to have to let it roll off you. You're on the side of law and order here. And you're not fighting just for yourselves. Multiply this by a hundred, by a thousand times across the country, and you begin to see a terrifying picture power over the individual by a private organization, power to take away the very bread from a man's mouth by denying him the right to work in peace. The right to work in peace. This was the only desire, the only hope of each man in the splinter group as he weighed my husband's words. With this hope and in the belief that they would be heard, the splinters attended the union meeting that was to decide whether the strike would be abandoned or whether it would continue. You've heard the expression railroaded. That's exactly what happened to the splinters in the union meeting. They never got a chance to open their mouths. The verdict was signed, sealed, and delivered just the way the bosses wanted it. No acceptance of terms and no secret ballot in spite of their constitution. 
anyone who went back to work, regardless of need or belief, was a scam and subject to threats, abuse, and violence. The splinters knew what they faced. I tried to keep up the normal business of living, although it was difficult under the circumstances. I went to visit young Mrs. Cartwright in her trailer home. She tried to give the impression of contentment as I inspected the new baby. A beautiful little girl. But Betty Cartwright was worried. Her husband had gone through the picket lines to get to his job. We women of Princeton were sick at heart. Sick at heart as the months dragged on and the violence increased. Seat covers slashed. Paint thrown on automobiles. Ed was approached to testify before the state legislature, which was holding hearings on a proposed right to work law. Would reports of his testimony endanger our very family? I wondered. Could the strangers from out of state who stalked the streets of Princeton break the splinter's will for freedom? Now they would try. The goons were finally ready to show the world what they thought of the rights of man. Clark, did you see them? Oh, they were gone before I got here. Come on, if there's anybody in that house, we gotta help them. Violence, dirty and utter, was the goons' method of subduing Princeton. And their attacks on us continued. Hello? You're next, Greenfield. What? I said you're next, Greenfield. You're next, Greenfield. You're next, Greenfield. Oh, Ed. Home was to become a barricade against the menace outside. Good night, girls. Mama, why do we have to sleep in a basement? Run along, dear. Good night, Mama. Good night, Good night. Mama. Oh, Lord, protect the children from this evil that stalks us. My husband, Ed, a minister of Christ, taking up arms to protect his family against the threat of evil outside. What had become of the way of God? What was to become of us? That the evil on that night was not for us. Tragedy stalked the quiet road where Larry Cartwright and his family slept in their trailer home. Men, who knows what kind of men, spewed their hate in a hail of bullets. through the brain of Betty Cartwright's baby. In the morning, Princeton took a long look at itself, and it was a look of loathing. Now, even the most militant striker could see that he'd been misguided by the labor bosses. There was no one left who would keep the strike going. Everyone in Princeton was a splinter now. For all practical purposes, the strike was over. In a few days, the settlement was made. And ironically, that same day, 
a state right to work law was passed. Too late to do us any good. But it was over. And we thanked God we had not been harmed. While we prayed that the life of the Cartwright baby be spared. Finally, the good news came. Almost through some miracle, it seemed, the doctor said the baby would recover. The sacrifice to union violence had escaped, and there was rejoicing in the Cartwright family. That's what happened here in Princeton, Indiana. Although the scars on the town don't show now, time has not obliterated them. The town has changed, and her people have changed. Many have left to make a new start elsewhere. The hate and bitterness generated by the strike still with them. Families are still torn with dissension and friendships have ended. The scars on the town don't show, but the scars on the minds of the people, will they ever leave us? I wonder. And why I wonder? What trick of destiny decreed that our town must fulfill Kingsley's prophetic line, men must work and women must weep. It's been a real experience playing the role you've just seen. I've certainly learned a great deal. And now I'd like for you to meet the woman who actually lived this story. Winifred Greenfield of Princeton, Indiana. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before the events in this story started, I didn't know that workers could be forced to join a union whether they wanted to or not. And if I had known, I would have thought that it was none of my affair. I know now that it is my affair, that freedom is everybody's business. The working man's, the businessman's, the ministers, and the housewife. All you have to do is ask yourself, could my town be next? And if you think that what happened to us couldn't happen to you, remember, that is what we thought in Indiana. Must you wait to come face to face with tyranny as we did? <laughs> 